Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is our sweet little project on Beacon Hill. Um, somebody had a good question about cost. Um, so that house is about 850 square feet. I think the garage was not included in that, but we did kind of bring the garage into the envelope and also into kind of the lived space. Um, we conditioned it, we made it an auxiliary room. So I think all said they were about a thousand square feet um, in the end. They have their Peloton in there, extra shoe storage, et cetera. It's a nice little spot. Um, and then cost per square foot for that was about 485. There was a lot of troubleshooting involved with that project. Um, and changes the one way. Yeah, I, it's always, you know, with, with rehab, I mean, this really, we could call this remodel. It was really a rehab, you know, um, it was very outdated, deferred maintenance. Um, it was really in rough shape at the beginning and we really brought it up to uh, feeling like, you know, a brand new home. Yeah. Um, so I think cost per square foot reflects there. Um, also with some of the, uh, you know, higher end choices on um, the envelope and... Well, I think the finishes yeah. also a little bit. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is, you know, kind of the crux of this project, it was really about comfort um, and comfort in a really holistic way. You know, our clients uh, didn't want a drafty house. Um, they also wanted more, they were in the beginning thought that they wanted more space, um, but we kind of pushed back on that. Um, and that's something that we are, we always like to look at and we like to, um, you know, ask our clients, uh, and, um, be a little challenging in the yeah, challenge, programming about yeah, exactly. what is actually needed and what is actually worth spending money on. How is the square foot that you really need? Because um, it helps us with budget if we can um, be more moderate with our square footage. And when uh, flow is really taken into consideration and good design happens, people tend to need less square footage. Exactly. Um, I so think much, much think less than you would think oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy to assume, you know, everybody needs 4,000 square feet for a family, but you know, the truth is you can get away from with much less yeah. and really make that meaningful space rather than wasted space. Yeah. And feel good and let light in and feel airy and feel connected to outdoors. One of the things that um, I always like to point out in this house that in the common space there are three openings three windows one is a big slider um two other you know picture ish windows and we you can see those here yeah there's a big uh picture window here with an operable panel and then a 10 foot slider and those kind of mirror each other and then in the kitchen we added a um Floor to ceiling floor window. Floor to ceiling window um, that floods the kitchen area with light as well. And and the kitchen's compact, you know, it's it's a it's a cook's kitchen, but it's um, a small size kitchen. It really helps to just make it feel free and airy. Mm -hmm. um, so windows are doing um, a lot of work for us in this space, actually. Yeah, the natural light. And the nice thing about that is that you know. A lot of this natural light is coming from this ambient light, and the southern light is uh, protected by those by the steel awning. Um, so, James, will you talk to me a little bit about um, those details in the front and and the decision making there? Because they're they're a nice nod to you know, the steel details. Yeah, the steel. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's another sort of um, problem we encountered um, in this front area here. There's an over entry overhang here, and it was, uh, you know, the whole building was in pretty rough shape to begin with, and the um, 
entry, you know, as we got into it, it was determined that it was sagging by, I think, two inches or so. It just had, it was, you know, bad engineering and, and not deferred maintenance and just hadn't been kept up. Yeah. So we ended up um, having, you know, a fun solution um, in a custom steel detail. It wasn't really that expensive or complex. Um, we just dropped it in and... And it was something that was needed anyways, yeah, right? And we just straightened out the overhang and gave it a little more interest, um, organized the physical you know, space around the entry a little bit more um, and made the soffit um, really a pretty uh, part of the entry. And so did you guys do woofy modeling on this space to understand about the sunshade in front and we didn't or was it know, just kind of on this one i mean the the the, the performance side of this um project honestly came in later in the project and the design phases and so it was a response to um some of the the expanded the scope creep and mm -hmm. um some of the permit requirements we ended up having um you know, in the in the schematic design phase, we were sort of back and forth about what the uh, scope was going to be. And when we got to the place where it was expanded, the feedback was going to require earthquake retrofit and egress for the new windows. So the windows had to get bigger. And we needed to do um, an energy, uh, you know, retrofit too. So this was kind of diving or jumping in feet first on that. Um, so we didn't end up doing any modeling on this um, at the time because of, you know, we were doing standard details in terms of our the, the exterior um, insulation and blown in stuff. So um, we didn't seem like it needed it. It would have been fun to do that normally with um, performance projects. Yeah, James and I are just kind of chatting about this. So let's see, the shelf detail. This shelf detail was cool. Tell us a little bit about it, James. Why did you guys decide to do this? Um, well, we like to do, um, we have the, we have shelf in a number of projects and it's a fun um, detail aesthetically because um, as you can see here, you know, it looks like those, you know, there's no, there's no depth to the shelf. And so the, um, anything you put on it, it looks like it's kind of floating there. It's almost like it kind of lends to like this airiness that we were mm -hmm. trying to create in the space. Yep. Since this house was a small space. We also don't really, um, you know, a lot of times we try and shy away from uppers in kitchens um, just because I, of that spatial, it, it increases the sense of space. Uh, and, you know, if you organize the space around it, you can really, and you, you know, a lot of people have things they want to do that be kind of a fun um, combination of those things. Will you tell me a little bit about like your thoughts around um, just the intersection between space and um green aspects and um how like conscious building and green building and you know the this the space that we're choosing to design kind of how they interact together and how they lend themselves to holding each other up with what just space and and yeah. green building and um well and it makes me think of is what we were just about the, you know, limitations. Every project has a series of limitations. What we talk about in the beginning of our design process is goals and constraints. And, you know, everybody wants, has a bunch of ideas about what their goals are for the project. And what's oftentimes not as clear is what are the constraints. And so, you know, and looking at the existing conditions, the house or the building lot, um, begin to sort of shape what the constraints of the project are the other is the other big one is budget so there's everybody no matter what the size of the project has a budget um, and so everything has to fit together thinking about the fundamentals of the space in thinking about circulation how 
you move you know, between the spaces and how you use the spaces and how you can have multi-use spaces mm -hmm. um, is all pretty fundamental. And I think for us, you know, that goes hand in hand with the performance side. Like yeah. for us, the performance is a fundamental. And so we try and orient towards, you know, building tech wall assemblies and other things that you know, we consider uh, our standard details. And then we, you know, integrate the design finishes and the, the, uh, the other things that are kind of the jewelry of the house uh, around that. And as you can see with this project, you know, you, you can have a high performance house and have it be really uh, pleasing and, um, you know, have a minimalist aesthetic with some uh, sort of rich textural elements as well. So, um, Does anybody have any questions for us? Anybody have any points of interest that they'd like us to speak about? Um, we can talk about, you know, the particular wall assembly on this house. We um, used a really cool um, uh, material called arrow barrier to, to mm -hmm. really rehab the um, existing envelope. Yeah, the existing envelope on this, so this one. Yeah, this was a challenging um, application for performance retrofit because of the condition of the house just the structure of the house. It has a ventilated crawl space and a ventilated attic. And so we were really limited to the condition, you know, using the condition space, which is below the ceiling and above the floor and wall to wall um, as the, um, um, as the, where we could apply this, this, um, the error barrier stuff. So we used the subfloor as one barrier. We used the inside of the sheathing uh, for the walls and obviously the, the windows. And then the uh, ceiling drywall was installed prior to uh, doing the aero barrier process. And so we just had this little box here that we sealed up nice and tight. We've got insulation here, we've got insulation here, and we've got the insulation on the outside and on the inside of the walls. Um, but we did the aero barrier prior to the interior insulation being installed. So this little, the interior space became this nice tight little box and we achieved a really um, impressive uh, rating on that, um, the air changes per minute. Um, so tell me a little bit about the air changes per minute and what that means. Like well, it's just a, technically, it's a but measurement. Then also yeah. what it means for, for like a lived experience. Well, you know, modern buildings, you know, the, the longevity of a house is based on its ability to dry and, um, and stay warm, basically. And so, you know, uh, the sort of um, 19th or 20th century strategy for that was having um, a house that breathes. Maybe you guys have heard that before, like a house that breathes. I mean, essentially, there's a bunch of leaky holes all throughout the um, house. But it can dry out. But it can dry out, yep. And then you you power it with this big furnace, mm -hmm. and you blow hot air blow around. Forced air. Yep, and you're filling it with hot air, and so everything is kind of drying to the outside. But it's also leaking. It's uh, also leaking, yeah. yeah. And you don't really know where your air is coming from. So modern, um, you Mostly know. Mostly probably from right by where the furnaces in yes. the dank, nasty. <laughs> exactly. The yeah. crawl space yeah. or the attic or wherever. Somewhere. Charming. Yeah. <laughs> so the modern approach is to uh, have an envelope that's tightly sealed and then have air delivered uh, mechanically from the outside, filtered and, and um, uh, controlled like uh, the, heat, the, the climate, sorry, the, the temperature of the air is um, maximized so that what's coming in is warmed by the air going out. Uh, and this house has a couple of um, ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, um, that are basically, um, you know, it's a balanced um, um, fan and it's bringing air in and pushing air out at the same speed so that the, the um, pressure in the house stays at a, a balanced um, state. Uh, and that warm air that's being exhausted warms up the, the cold um, 
fresh air that's coming in. And so, you know, in a, in a modern house, you don't have to open the window in order to get fresh air. You can, and there's nothing, there's no, you know, no, nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, if we don't add that mechanical ventilation, the, the leakiness isn't there. And so that the fresh air, you really do need to have that fresh air delivered to have the, the warm and dry um, space. Um, so, so there, there's some of the components. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, for the heating and cooling of this house, we have the, um, we're, we're, somebody's asking us to oh, yeah. describe the aero barrier process. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a, sorry, we're going to kind of hung on this slide a bit. Um, we have a little animation here. Um, so basically that's actually, this is, these are picks actually. Yeah. So it's, it's a process where or you kind of isolate the um, envelope um, by um, masking off, you know, the doors and windows so that they don't get damaged. And then the house, you, you um, seal up all the other openings and then you blow a blower door and you blow air into the house. And so the whole uh, envelope becomes pressurized. So it's got air blowing out. And then they set up these... Um, I don't know what they call them, uh, nozzles um, around the house, and they spray a latex, like a vaporized latex caulk. So it's it's um, vapor, and because the house is already pressurized, that vapor is now going through all the little cracks everywhere that um, where the air is escaping because of the pressurization, and as that vapor goes through those tiny little openings, it starts clogging up those openings and filling them up. Everything down to, uh, everything up to a half an inch can be filled with this stuff. We did a ton of prep on this with spray foam and tape and all kinds of stuff um, to get the rating that we got, but it, it is essentially will work for anything. And, and it was a half day. Yeah, it was pretty quick. It, it just kind of happened, like the guys came and set up and we had been prepping for, you know, what? A, a week and a half. A week and a half or, or so. so. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a question that kind of correlates to that. Um, what did we do with the floor? The floor is a, is a, um, was, is an oak, uh, no, you know, typical. Go back here. This is the after the arrow bearer area was in, uh, performed. This is opening the front door. So that vapor is all latex caulk that's coming escaping from the house now um, after the process is complete. So the house was filled with that vapor, pressurized and going out through all the different holes. Um, and Thank so. Hopefully that that. Pretty really it's, just, it's just latex it's caulk. An, it's so a natural it, what happens latex inside material. is it just the pressurization stops and everything just falls to the floor and you can basically sweep it up or scrape it up sometimes a little bit. It's a little bit sticky, uh, especially when you first walk in. Um, but but how, it, how was the floor insulated? Yeah, so so the flooring, the floor assembly is, um, let's see if I can find a picture. And, and aero barrier is pretty cheap, right? It, it is, it's pretty affordable, yeah. So here's the floor. Um, it's just, uh, I think they were two by tens or two by eights. I don't remember. Uh, there's some, some post and beam kind of structure here. We had to do an earthquake retrofit in addition to the work, the other stuff that we did. Uh, but essentially this is framing and sh uh, uh, sub floor and then a finished floor of white oak, which you can see in some of these finished shots here. Um, in the living room, you can see. Well, there's the drawing of it, but there's the living room. There we go. So um, the whole house is white oak, um, two inch white oak with a kind of a, a white um, wash stain on it. The insulation. Yeah, so it's insulated um, in the bays, in the stud bays. Uh, and when the arrow barrier was done, it was done to the subfloor. So before the wood got, uh, before the uh, oak was put on. And then what was the cost of the arrow barrier? Do you have, I mean, I mean, it's like $2,000 or less. I think. And, and then 
you know, we did a lot of that and we had cost of the, you know. The day of having them out is the, pretty affordable. The day of having them out. For um, what it does, you know, it's just amazing. But in terms of applying something like this to a new construction, it would be, you know, scheduled at a, you know, strategic moment in the build. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be the same prep associated. Be as difficult because we didn't have the complications of the remodel. There was a brick, um, a brick chimney to deal with, and um, the lid had to be installed. But yeah, there's a bunch of uh, much more. We had some internal costs associated with applying well, to it to do with this project. Yeah, yeah as a retrofit. Yeah, for sure. When everything's open, just when it awesome. happens. Yeah. Um, Does that answer everybody's questions that we've? Uh, seen on chat and again you guys feel free unmute yourselves if you want <laughs> um yeah what else this is a sweet little mantle the 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 clients have um family in the skagit valley and this is from a friend's barn and it was just a simple way to treat you know something something simple on the existing brick and meaningful for the client. Um, in the kitchen, um, you know, we we kind of rearranged the orientation of the kitchen. It used to be on the other side of the of the room, and we brought it over to this corner and um, created some, you know, uh, kind of a galley kitchen with an island peninsula and. Um, so there this was, is what it was like when they moved in. That's on the other side of the room. That's where the dining room is now. And over here was kind of a laundry space and a back door. You can see the back door. Um, and so, you know, pushing the kitchen over here um, with the uh, relation to the backyard um, and through living room. And then this door that you can see here is to that auxiliary room. Yep. Um, that really gives some options for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, we did some of this uh, steel detail. This, you know, there was a couple of fun little steel details, the shelves, and the sunny tree. Um, I think, you know, a small amount of, you know, these higher cost elements are really a fun way to upgrade it, even, you know, an affordable small project like this. Um, these are the big openings, you know, there's, there's this, this is into the kitchen, um, and then there's, um, 10 foot wide, um, slider that, uh, went in, in the dining room. So in the living room, dining room, there's kind of a, a pair of, there's a window that's 10 feet and a slider that's 10 feet. Um, and in the bathroom, the bathroom, I think we just sort of talked about that, but essentially, you know, the. Part of going back to the sort of core uh, principles of this house is that we reused the existing square footage. So this is a pretty typical sized uh, bathroom for you know mid-century, five by eight-ish, I think. Uh, but with some reorganization, um, even with this, it's still all set up the same with the uh, vanity vanity, toilet, and bathing area. And we've got the same thing, got a vanity, toilet, and bathing area. But with some improvements, you know, uh, some glass and some um, continuing the floor, uh, floor material and continuing the wall material, having some connect with these things. And you um, said that window opening isn't much bigger than what was there. It's not really. really. No. So just, you know, looking to add some and this went by shell was really one of those thoughtful details that we dug in with a client and yeah. asked them how they how they bathed, what they want to do. We talked about, you know, just how can we make this square footage really meaningful for you? Mm -hmm. And and that in of itself is kind of is green. You know, let's let's not pour a big huge amount of feet and add on more square footage to this house. Let's use what you have. Um, let's make it beautiful. Let's open it up. Let's bring natural light in. Um, Thank you, Perry. Yeah. 
well, we made a lot of design changes on this house. We also did a lot of performance changes on it. And, you know, the, the design aspects of this house really lend themselves to the performance. But let's kind of get to tax a little bit with the, um, Yeah, I mean, the, the house was a, in really bad shape when they bought it, um, when the client bought it. And so it needed a lot of work, no matter what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the scope kind of fluctuated through schematic design, uh, trying to find the balance. Um, and with some feedback from the city, you know, with the amount of work that we were going to be doing, they wanted us to do, uh, it, it became a substantial alteration. And that means that the, um, you know, the city required some um, changes in the window size for egress. Uh, you know, the old windows were kind of high and small up on the wall in the bedroom. And so we need to make those a little bit bigger and then we need to do a uh, quick, quick retrofit, structural retrofit. And, and then some energy stuff is what kind of, you know, created the opportunity to really jump feet first into this um, performance side of things. So, um, you know, we could have gone code minimum, uh, but, you know, there was an opportunity to maximize this and we took it. So um, from, from that, you know, what, the strategy was basically to, uh, you know, at the, at the point where we made these decisions to go high performance, you know, the, the walls were going to be open. And so, and there was going to be new siding new windows and you know the logic really made sense to um apply the best practice uh for, for the envelope um so we added um some exterior insulation um that really kind of you know wraps the whole building in this warm layer um covering all of you the have a picture of that don't you uh yeah i was just gonna win this for a sec um so it shows, you know, the, um, you know, this is the performance uh, of the wall assembly. So this is using a, a program called Therm that kind of analyzes the wall assembly. Um, this is, you know, pretty rudimentary, but it helps. So during the summer, you can see that the hot temperature really never penetrate the wall and the interior surfaces really do stay cool. Um, and, um, that's because partly because of this continuous insulation, you know, and in the, in the reverse, in the winter, uh, the warm really doesn't ever escape um, and the, the cold um, is kept at bay. So the, those, the exterior insulation is really uh, simple and um, a dummy proof way of, uh, of getting an envelope that's gonna stay thermally um, uh, high performance. And then, the addition of the air sealing component really ties it together with the rest of the um, functionality. Because if you if you thermally envelope, you know, create some a thermal envelope, it really doesn't solve anything if the air is leaking out of the building. Um, Can I jump in with a quick question yeah. from Tracy? Um, she's asking, what was the end result of cost of investment versus real estate value slash energy savings costs, et cetera? Um, Good question, Tracy. Yeah, I think that the end result, um, I, don't, I don't know quite the math on that, um, how that works, but I think that this was about 450 to buy, uh, and they put another, I want to say 400 or 450. And so in the end, they've got, you know, approximately $900,000 of investment. Um, and you know, it's not a lot of square footage, but it's high quality and high performance and it suits them quite well. So, so I mean, I think the value judgment there from the client's point of view was they really liked the location. They wanted a house that worked for them. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, I think that there was a component of this for them that was like uh, voting with our pocketbook somewhat for sure um in the materials and in the performance yeah stuff, for sure. and so while uh it may not be like an equation with the numbers there is 
like added their inland experience for them um, that their house is um, an in-city lot that is comfortable from the point of view of temperature um, costs monthly costs for their bills but also the other consideration for this location in particular was um, in city you know when everything's closed it's really quiet in their home they're close to Georgetown, close to a flight path, so um, airplane noise was reduced significantly, which was important for them. And not something that people think about often. Um, even if you're not in the flight path, there is city noise that um, we all live with. And if it's if it's minimized, I think it's a it's a big plus for for lifestyle actually. Yeah, just for mental health. Yeah, <laughs> really. But I think that you know, in terms of um, Tracy's question, it's like, I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't. I think that you know, when you're talking about you know this city and the real estate market, you know, you're buying anything you're buying that's you know under five hundred thousand dollars is you know from for all intents and purposes, it's a tear, tear down. down. And so, you know, you're either using it and putting a bunch of money in one, you're putting money in one way or the other. And so, you know, a $400,000 remodel is not a lot of money for, um, you know, a lot of, you can, you can spend that money a lot of different ways, right? You can get a variety of different uh, uh, results from that effort uh, and that resource. Um, and I think that this application is a good example of choosing to not um, make um, an investment in square footage and, um, you know, uh, space that's not going to be long lasting and be really useful. So, you know, the, they are just a couple and they don't need a ton of space. The house was fine for what they needed to begin with. And with the improved, uh, you know, performance elements, along with the design, um, uh, the fundamentals of the sort of improved um, flow of circulation and um, bringing more light into the space, natural light, yeah. yeah. And it just feels airy. Yeah, I mean, if, that's the biggest thing I think oh, about this sorry, the video ended. project. Um, Oops. Um, is that we took this little old dark kind of bummer house and and each space in of itself the bathroom the kitchen the living room they all um that change from being dark and closed off and closed in to open light bright um airy feel here's some of the before as each you can see it's, space it's really has that rough. feel absolutely now with what we've done with it um, yep. the bedrooms have a lot of light um a combination you know a, a balance of light and privacy the living room has a ton of light the dining room has a ton of light even the even the garage you know with the new garage door yep. auxiliary room flex space really has a ton of light too and it feels airy you know we we it's using the existing uh infrastructure so to speak to maximize it and then you know for the garage in particular it had the cathedral ceilings and you know uh emphasizing that with some lighting and some um simple finishes it really made that space too so this is the existing floor plan and you can see that it is um the original a little plan. bit chopped up um you know the kitchen was a barrier to the outside so we kind of slid it over and you know opened up the backyard um, straight from, from the front door and really created some um, visual and physical connection to the uh, garden in the backyard. Um, it's a simple, simple um, gable structure. It's got a little interest in the overhang um, tree. That actually ended up being kind of um, an element here because we had a the structure of that overhang was um, falling apart and had not been up, uh, kept up. And so there was about a two inch sag, I think, in this far corner. And to rectify that, we just you know installed this simple steel structure. It's very small members, just simple and, and um, clean lines. 
and really tidied it up and created some physical um, organization to the entryway. So here it is before you can sort of see the condition of it um, and, the, and um, you can see the sag there and how we were propping it up. And then once the steel was installed, we jacked it up, straightened it out and um, came out pretty nice. Um, we go into some detail here to show some of that here. Um, the, the steel was just a simple two part um, assembly. You know, the post was just embedded in some concrete and then the beam slid through the post and had um, a connection point inside there. Uh, really nice and clean. And then the, the gable, or sorry, the uh, soffit um, was just had the perforated uh, venting. And with that, we, we added the sunshade too, and that's kind of part of the performance of this house. It's a passive element that helps the house perform, mm -hmm. stay cool, because um, that, that, that house had massive southern exposure there, and we yeah. really didn't want to blast it, um, so yeah, that, it really helps. That southern window has, is, is very exposed, so we protected it from rain and sun with that steel, an additional um, steel component. And it was kind of fun, just sort of follow the roof line um, and actually from the wall came, the shadow comes all the way down to the bottom of the window. Um, so that's the new uh, living room window and that's the new slider, 10 foot slider on this end in the dining room um, out to the backyard. And so we took that, that dividing wall down um, and really you can see just opened up space, reframed that whole wall there. Um, and you know, nothing major, but it was um, created a huge difference there. And both in, in the natural light and the circulation, I think too. So here's some, um, some of the details that we added. There's uh, LED task lights underneath the shelves um, that's recessed into the uh, tile. So it actually kind of re reflects off of the bottom of the, of the metal shelf and um, shines onto the, um, creates some interesting shadows. This is that big opening uh, in the kitchen. So that's like a four foot window, I think, maybe a little bit over four foot with a little operable part so you can get fresh air, but you know, it just really gives a sense of space inside the kitchen. Um, without you know creating complications with actually getting out that uh, making that a door would have made um, you know challenging to it would have been a hallway as well but with the window it's a beautiful you know um, connection to the outdoors and makes it feel more spacious without making uh, any other complications and and we really kind of echoed that thinking in the bathroom too where we were um, wanting to work with the existing space. We were wanting to open it up. Yeah. We were wanting to um, create a little better functionality. Yep. So the the bathroom is a typical size bathroom. It's, it's nothing special. It's got the same um, orientation that it had originally with a vanity, toilet, and then um, bathing area. Um, this shows a little detail on the wall of the medicine cabinet and the wet dry shelf. Uh, so there it is before. These are the Redfin photos. So same same placement of the fixtures. We just opened it up and took out the barriers. Uh, and you know, continuous material um, really helped really, here. Really helps align that. Nice linear drain. Um, some continuity in the lines. This the wet dry shelf goes all the way, so you you have that functionality in the shower and uh, above the toilet and the vanity. And above I, that is the medicine cabinets where all the stuff is. And it's fully accessible, but also nicely put away. Um, the floor, like I said, is another example of a continuous surface. So that pattern goes all the way through to the shower pan and to a linear drain. And then there's a, a connection transition point at the hallway and to the uh, white oak that has a brass detail that kind of calls back to some other brass elements in the house. Um, so again, this is the, um, you can see. And that same, again, in the, in the auxiliary room where we were like, okay, this space exists. 
what are we let's do with think it? about how we're really going to use it in a smart way um and i think we were really, really successful that works for the client's lifestyle they love it yep they had this this great um cathedral ceiling detail already and so we recessed some of the kitchen functionality here and then you know uh just made made what was there a little bit better and again you know you're here at the green home tour these types of choices about reorganizing our space that already exists or double do, going double down on living in a small well-designed space is the root of how and be green mm -hmm. it's a passive way to be green and so that's something that we're really oriented towards we want to think about as americans as humans on the earth do um you know families of three and four need 2500 square feet we don't think so um I, we so think we know that we can design you know a beautiful you know 1800 square feet that is beautiful that lives beautifully that lives open and happy where everybody can come together and where everybody can have private space too so we really believe in that and we think that that's kind of the cornerstone of how we can orient towards building green and making spaces like this where you know it's it's multifunctional yeah. space you know the laundry room is in there the utilities are in there the peloton is the in there the peloton is in there um sh extra and it feels really nice it's just like a sweet little it feels kind of like a little studio spot yeah. it's really really a nice little area that all we, things. it was that's what was there so. and then all of these things um exist within the confines of the performance envelope that we created and um we feel like it's a lovely intersection between kind of passive practical practicality and then high performance elements that are making our house a, a really um efficient workhorse for us yep. and, and adding some some simple design touches that will, you know, uh, extend all of that effort that much further. Because, it's, you know, yeah. having, having a durability is also about aesthetics and making, um, making something that's beautiful is gonna last as well. We've been going over there recently and, um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the comfort aspect um, you know, the house is a tight little box and you know we've had some hot weather and some of this smoke and the clients were telling me that the you know they really they don't um, have any real cooling needs um, during the summer even uh, they said they sort of put on the they have one needs um, and some uh, supplemental heat by uh, radiant panels and they just haven't really been using that. It just stays cool uh, every day, um, even without any cooling. So it's pretty interesting with that um, exterior insulation, uh, the difference it makes in terms of the consistency of the temperature inside. And then they have the ERVs that provide the mechanical ventilation. So there's always fresh air. Um, I think the other thing to add about, you know, comfort in, in this home with the, with the um, envelope that we created is it's a city site. We're close to Georgetown. We're close to flight path. Yeah. And, you know, every time we've gone over there, we're, we're pretty close with the clients. We live in the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, we've had, you know, post-project meetings with them, et cetera, and it's always really quiet inside. And I think that that's, you know, something you always think about when they're thinking about upgrading, mm -hmm. but it is like a really um, subtle, but uh, deeply effective um, point of comfort that, you know, is really palatable yeah. when you're experiencing it. Yeah, it's not something we think about very often. We are at the end of the flight path, so yeah. it's pretty significant change. Um, 
I'm, I'm hearing that our audio is dropping oh. occasionally. Um, I don't know really what to do about that. So this was before. These were the, you know, red pictures. It's just yeah. your classic kind of teeny weeny war box. And, you know, our clients were came to us originally and were like, let's add on. This is a teeny house we want to add on. And we heard from them in programming exercises and you know part of what we want to do inside of design um what's your usual wall for assembly for seattle climate um well exterior insulation i mean i think a typical it depends if it's model construction but um, you know we got the stud wall and that is our, our normal for that is to fill that with uh, blown in insulation. So it's called uh, bibs. And that means that you net the, there's actually a picture here in the kitchen, I believe. Um, you blow in. So there's a stapled up um, layer and it becomes like a tight, taut um, skin. And then blown in insulation is added to the cavity. And then on the outside, we do EPOM or, um, um, or rock wool. Um, and that basically, you know, wraps the whole house in a sweater of insulation and prevents the thermal uh, bridging from studs and things like that. Let me find the, uh, there you go. So this is the addition and then this is two layers of four, uh, sorry, two layers of two inch overlapping seams um, EPS foam. And that's about a 35, R35 wall. And that's um, pretty solid. Um, like I said, the temperature in, in the house doesn't change very much. There's also a ton of blown in um, in the attic. And this is all filled here in the, in the crawl space as well. Um, so, and, and you know, these, these windows also were not that high performance. They're just uh, Marvin, relatively affordable Marvin windows. So the assembly could have been, you know, uh, upgraded even further by adding some performance windows. We were looking for a really practical approach mm -hmm. to convert for this house. Um, they and wanted some amenities and some uh, budget towards some finishes too. Yeah. So we were just trying to spread the love, so to speak. Um, you have to kind of choose, um, you have to choose your combination of amenities and, um, you know, frequently people are, you know, pushing for finish level, um, higher finish level stuff. And so sometimes this, you know, the envelope stuff gets um, put to the wayside, um, which is kind of you know, a bummer, but we try and orient towards kind of a standard, like you were asking Amanda, um, for a wall assembly that's going to be a high performance wall. And then that's just our normal approach. And um, we kind of take that out of the, out of the equation um, so that the other things fall into place um, around that. Um, I think the, um, the, this space too, the, uh, garage space was another challenge. Um, we actually ended up spray foaming um, the lid there. I just wanted to, um, so what Amanda was asking, Foundation. were we able to insulate the patient? Yeah. Crawl space. Um, so we did not, we, we just insulated the crawl space. Um, so it's a ventilated um, crawl space. Sometimes we've done what's called a warm, crawl space, I guess, I can't remember exactly, but where you close up the vents, um, but this we did it ventilated. So it is just the floor assembly that's um, insulated and- And they're a shoes off house. Yep. And the floors are really cozy actually. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, the heating is- Yeah, it's not hot. It's just kind of- It's warm, yeah. It's room temperature. And that's the other, that's the bottom ceiling layer for the aero barrier was the sub floor. Um, so, Granted, the subfloor were filled as well, but the uh, heating is is uh, a single mini split unit um, in the living room, 
and that serves as the heating for the whole house. There are supplemental um, radiant panels uh, in the ceilings in the bedrooms. Uh, just because we wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be cold spots. cold spots, you know, in the bedrooms. I don't think they've really turned them on though. Just in the dead of winter, maybe they've turned them on for two yeah. weeks yeah. when it's, you know, 20. So a single mini split system, the ERVs help to exchange the air and keep the heat. Um, and, you know, and then the garage space is unheated. Um, gets a fair amount of, gets a fair amount of solar gain from the um, south facing garage door. Um, and plus they use it as an exercise room and laundry room and, and utility space a little bit. So it's, it's not, um, they don't need it to be uh, conditioned as, as much. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you guys build from new, uh, do you do new construction or do you only do renovation? Yeah, we do new construction. We do well. both, yeah. yeah. So uh, are you a proponent of the, um, the closed and conditioned crawl spaces? Um, like when they just, you know, they seal it all up, make sure it's normally sealed as well as air sealed? Yeah, I think, you know, I think um, there, there are pros and cons, but I think that it can be done so that it's closed. Yeah, I think that it's, it's I would say, better. Do you have a crawl space? Or are you thinking about building new with the crawl space? I, no, we were just thinking about building new. Well, I'm more thinking about building new. And I, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what it is that I want in terms of where I want to spend my money. Um, and I really, really like the, uh, the idea of a house working as a machine, you yeah. know, and, and working properly. Well, it does anyway, so you might as well think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. um, because it is a machine and it either works if it's If you're going to do a crawl space, I would say it should be conditioned. Um, uh, but, the, you know, slab on grade is also a good option for that. Um, you can, you know, build the slab on... Um, Obviously, it depends on site, too. You yeah, know? but in general, you you just build it on a big layer of... Foam and then that... Uh, so there's this like underneath the foam. Uh, sorry, underneath the slab. I'm um, sorry, you dropped out. On top. I'm sorry, you dropped in out there. The, Did you say, like, a floating slab on... Um, a layer of styrofoam? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, um, we have a design for that um, on a project that's not built yet. But I mean, it's kind of, you know, people um, kind of get weirded out by the house on some foam, but it's, it's really normal. It's very high PSI foam and totally right. structurally sound. Have you guys ever used that uh, material? Um, I hadn't heard of it before gravel it's like a, a recycled glass foam yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no we haven't we haven't heard. used it but we just actually did a site walk uh in eastern washington um on a project and our builder friend is using it there on a really major major pour that's a big huge space mm -hmm. um and it looked cool and we talked about it a little bit yeah. What are your What is your interest in in the performance side, Amanda? Uh, I don't know. That's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a fascination. It's kind of a hobby with me. Um, you know, I'm I'm done homeschooling my kids, and you know, I, I just fell into architecture and just got really really interested in it. Cool. Um, I'd love to build a house myself. Like absolutely, just love to do that but you know i mean it's a big project and i'm in my 50s so you know it, it's kind of like not sure, really sure if we're going to do a project yeah. but but i really really interested in finding out how people are doing things because you hear a lot of different information from different sources you know uh like uh, the joseph liebrich uh talking about the perfect wall um and then I hear a lot of cons about that. And then you've got your different climates. It's it's just very complicated. So it it's I'm building just science anymore. Legitimately building science. Yeah. Um, and you know, it is all. And location oh. matters. Like I think that that 
to me uh, is like the biggest, highest, you know, elevated Working concept on. and important concept is that location and, and and even within that, you know, the sighting. Um, That's you know, what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, not just like the zone or or climate, but just the the sighting of the of the yeah. house mm -hmm. on the lot can make such a big difference. So you're talking about like soils. Think, yeah, soils, but like I mean, the or, sun hits. yes, the orientation of the house. Um, you know, getting getting or staying away from the sun. Um, and you know, trees and all these passive elements. Passive, the passive elements are huge. You know, if you're just going to, going to, um, it's like fighting fire with fire. You know, you you if you lean on just all of the technology for solving these problems, you're fighting uphill battle. But if you lean on the passive elements, it becomes really quite easy to you know get something very high performance and and you know get you towards net zero and, and all of these different things that are going to be, you and know. choose performance level for your lifestyle too. I think mm -hmm. that that's another part of it, you know. Yeah, I think everybody, you know, has their their set of um, the balancing act that they're trying to make. But I think that, you know, in general, my, my opinion is we do as much as we possibly can because every little bit matters. And, you know, I think this, this project in particular sort of, um, shows the difference you know you can sort of see from what it was to what it um is now and what we're up against with the the existing building stock um in this country you know and the, and the the life uh what is it called lifespan of the buildings you know in this country are it's so short you know the expectation yeah. of a house lasting longer than 50 70 years is is like Nobody's nobody thinks that it's going to do that, and which is tragic. And, and it's a travesty. Oh, it is. It's yeah, totally irresponsible. It's totally yeah. It's wrong. kind of the profit making machine. It's kind of how they do it. You yeah, know. Just, yeah, just, just throw it away in the landfill. And consume. well, because you can make more money because you sell a new house, kind of like Target. Right. Exactly. exactly. It's fast. It's a the fast fashion mm -hmm. thing <laughs> is a, yeah. it's happening in building. Yeah. Um, fast building. So I think I don't know. you know all of this does come back to durability in a way, you know, there's a lot of different, um, you know, ways to think about that process, the, the, the information, I guess, um, whether it's about, you know, performance or comfort or durability. Um, but, you know, essentially what we're trying to do is like make something of high quality that's going to last and be, and that has to mean all of those things coming together. It has to be something that is attractive and, long lasting in terms of aesthetics you know if it's ugly and doesn't feel good when you go inside then it's not going to last. yeah i mean somebody's going to come in one day and be like oh this is awful let's change it all around and then all that work that went into it even you know all the wall assemblies and all the technology will just get you know wasted because it wasn't um thought through what would you say is more cost effective um, doing a renovation like that where you're kind of ripping everything down to the studs or something you're can just do from new it's all contained and it's very predictable. Um, I think that the latter, but you can achieve that in remodel as well. It's all about planning. So I think it's about the design phase and um, you know, we have our design phase kind of starts, um, we treat it like a funnel, you know, and when we're out, it's a wide end funnel. And we're kind of talking about everything and anything um, during our intake process. And uh, what we end up with is a <clears throat> tight set of specifications and uh, drawings and, you know, documents that are ready for build. And in that process, you know, we're talking through all these th things about the prior um, for you and for and like what opportunities there are so you know depending on what the site is that really changes it you know what we what we're able to do there um, and then other things you know we haven't really talked about it but there's also opportunity for looking at um, prefabrication and panelization which I think is really interesting um, it's a we're gonna that uh, we're designing a, a house in um, the Metau Valley uh, in eastern Washington, 
and that's likely going to be um, analyzed. analyzed with a CLT. Have you heard of that? It's like um, cross laminated timber. Um, it's like plywood, but super oversized, I guess. It's uh, as, uh, layers of um, laminated timber um, and cross laminated timber. So they go against each other like they go like this. So it's structural and it has insulation yeah, and property. And what's also cool about it is that it um, sustains um, uh, healthy rests. Um, you can get the the material can use can can utilize small off off cuts yeah off cuts and small trees so small stunted stuff that normally would not be sellable or uh, you know have a market has a market with the CLT because it's shorter pieces and it's all finger jointed so um, that can be really interesting another layer to the like supply chain yeah, yeah. so if you think about you know the the three R's. Um, uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. You yeah. know, the re reduction is really what we're uh, illustrating with this project uh, because there's so many old houses like this. And, you yeah. know, the first step is to really take what we have and make the most out of it. Well, that's an, an exciting direction that you two have taken on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Very you can worthy. The, thank you. Yeah, and we can, we can use these uh, concepts in terms of new construction too. You know, we believe, mm -hmm. we do new construction and we believe, you know, we see in Seattle a lot of 2,500 square foot houses being built with uh, ADUs and DADUs. And we like those ADUs and DADUs, but we, we really wonder, you know, I feel that needs so much square footage. Um, we think that we can design a lovely family house that's 1800 square feet you know yeah, if you if you look at this jane you can see the existing floor plan here and yes. it's just two small bedrooms uh a living room here and the old kitchen was here um kind of blocking the access to the backyard and and so, and then over here was kind of a dead space of a laundry room and a back door. And just really inefficient. Yeah. But so that's we typical for the time. Exactly. Exactly. So we ended up just doing some simple, you know, reversal in oh. the layout, and brought the kitchen over to the other side, and then that allowed for the dining room to open up um, to the backyard and created this hallway, you know. Big, big visual hallway between the front and the back. What um, a and then, yeah, it, it really does make a difference. It's a radical difference, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey there. Welcome. So, uh, when we started looking at the at some of the realities of the build, you know, and, and the difference between you know remodel and new construction is often what you're working with in the remodel, and in this entryway we uh, ended up finding about a two inch sag in this overhang. Oh. And so we ended up just finding um, a solution here with this simple steel structure, post and beam structure that uh, supported the overhang, created some interest in the entry and uh, brought the finish level up, organized it a little bit and, and gave it a little bit more um, in the entryway there's a light there and the and the soffit became this beautiful feature as you come in and a nice little rain chain down to mm -hmm. the rain garden there you know the performance stuff the the green building elements of projects um really the way that we think about it is that it is part of a whole and you know the the design um of the project the circulation the use of space the finishes, mm -hmm. all of this comes together to make um, a project really, that's to, to us the really um, best definition of, of, of green and of performance um, is that it's, it's going to be durable, long lasting because it's you know, doing its job uh, on the performance side, it's doing its job on the, the Durable materials 
side is doing its job um, in the beauty and aesthetics so that nobody wants to tear it apart. They want to preserve it. They want to upkeep it. Um, and, you know, so all of these things come together and, and you know, this project is, is, is a good example of that because without the changes in the natural light, without the changes in the circulation, um, it wouldn't, you could do all of these uh, technical changes to the building and make it high performance, but it wouldn't be nearly the same level of, of um, transformation. And so all of these things come together to really uh, make or break, I think, a project in the end. And so that's why we like to, you know, why we do design build, why we have a um, robust design process, um, an architectural process, because that process really helps um, the build side, um, you know, land on the right decisions and, and lead us uh, to those answers. Um, and our projects end up being really holistic for clients. Yeah, and, I would say that's yeah. the reverse is true too, because during design, we get to, we have this build element that's, um, you know, uh, chiming in and critiquing and, and you know, question, asking questions throughout the design phase, because everything has to ultimately get built. And, and you know, those, the uh, ideas phase, can sometimes get um, swirling in, in only the ideas and, and the practicality, the buildability um, gets uh, forgotten about. And so the combination of those two elements really, I think, um, creates a um, robust, you know, process and method for, for getting a project to its highest potential. Um, and like I said, the definition of the performance and the, I think that this is a good example of taking the existing square footage and maximizing what's there. Yeah, we discussed with the clients putting a second story on it and with their budget uh, goals, we just felt like it was going to spread it real thin and kind of water down the intent of the project. Um, and we also just kind of wondered to them out loud, what do you need the what do you need more square footage for you know yep and so they um they responded and this is and i think they're really happy i think so too yeah i mean it's you know every project is a balance between the goals and constraints yeah, and not and everyone would make this exact decision and no, that's yeah and fine. you could do you could do a very similar thing with an addition with a yep. small addition mm -hmm or with the second story, but with the budget and with the goals, you know, this was the best balance of approach. And again, there were, there were some things we had to do because of the city um, that, you know, were not, you know, they weren't, they didn't ask for an earthquake retrofit, yeah. you know, for instance. They didn't ask for some of the requirements with the egress. Um, so some of these things that were required by the city, um, that's, a, that's the whole, one of the other elements of, of doing the design work is that we have to coordinate all of the different of the, of the project, the, all of, and, and make the most out of the limitations mm -hmm. that we're up against. And so, you know, this was a good um, compromise. And I think it's a good, also a good foundation for the future, you know, because the, 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 project the square footage of the lot is not huge um but the house really functions as well on it and you know the new connections to the outdoors um really makes that uh makes the most of that um so i think are we wrapping up at one yeah we're wrapping up at one if anybody has any final questions we do need to Go get our kids from the grandparents' house. <laughs> On the Saturday. Yep. Does anybody have any other questions about um, anything specific? I'm going to actually link our website in the chat right here. Um, just, you know, I, Good. feel free to reach out to us later on this week um yeah we're always available totally. i mean you know we didn't do any special promos or anything like that but you can always call us email us um you know our our info 
is on the website um, and it's um, and you can email me directly um, we have a form submission I get those emails you can also email me at uh, uh, Ashley at nestdesignbuild.com or hello or hello yeah lots of different ways to get a hold of us <laughs> we're a small team um, holler at us and we will um, we can always do a you know 45 minute chat about your project for sure yeah. I love doing that with people do it all the time <laughs>